Hello! Yes, I think that's working because I can hear the sounds. Let me just turn off the sounds on the right uh, piece of equipment and say hello. That's better. So, thank you for tuning in if you have and uh, for viewing this. This is where I dive in and uh, do some stuff in terms of creating some uh, adventure material for a dungeon adventure that I'm writing for Dungeon Crawl Classics. And before me, I have one of the maps that I'm working on. In fact, I'll go back to the other piece of information in terms of the, um, the actual adventure, so I can talk about that before I dive into detail on what I'm doing today. So there we have it. This is um, how I run things here. Basically, I'm running on a, a Raspberry Pi computer, which is a single board computer which is this little tiny single board computer, which I've got in a case beside my desktop here. Uh, I always like to mention what it uh, is that I'm using because uh, you know it's a great little um, computer, very cheap. And in fact, they do an eight gigabyte version as well, but I've got a four gig version there and I'm running a version of what's called Raspbian, which is a, uh, a Linux flavor of uh, software on there. Uh, so I'll get rid of that overlay. And as you can see here, I have the uh, the classic uh, Google Docs in front of me, which has got the adventure called Beneath the Valley of the Ultranols, which I've been writing. So as I work through, I um, fill it up as a dungeon, I put uh, creatures in there, and I use the Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, books to do that. And yeah, the setting itself, if I go to the... Where's the map gone? The map was on the first page, actually. There it is, Scarpsy. So Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Knolls is the working title. I've now done, what, 30 odd pages, I think. I can't remember the last count. It's not really giving me a page count here. Now, every word processor should have a page count right at the top by the title, shouldn't it, or something. Uh, anyway, so this is a map that I drew out on the first episode of this. So I'm now on, this is the 11th episode you've been watching. So I've been doing it every Saturday now for, uh, for 10 weeks plus. And um, additionally, you can see on those first ones, I, I drew this out, and the core of this adventure is about a location called the Oblex, which is a large temple structure which has got a goddess in it who's slowly dying because she's lost her followers. So essentially, the adventure plan is that the adventurers get involved in some sort of happening around this village called Cliff's End, um, which I put some notes that there might be a funeral happening in the town. And that's something I haven't written up yet, but uh, the, the first step of the adventure would be in these barrows. And as she dies, her death throes in her last few weeks are causing strange things to happen amongst the, the buried dead in the region. So that's a kind of hook into why they're investigating the barrow. And then eventually they'll get over to the obelix itself where you have to get down from the top. It's a large black obsidian cube and the only way in is like an entranceway on the top. And uh, that's it. That's the basic overview of this location. I've started to fill up with loads of monsters. So, um, and also, of course, just a, a kind of worthy mention on how I'm doing that. So, actually, I can bring up my desktop view. Here we go. There's that map again. But uh, here's all the goodies I've been using. So, basically, the uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics book, The Dungeon Alphabet by Michael Curtis. That's, that's nice. Not too shiny this week, so I'm just about seeing it. So this is a special edition cover version I got, um, but they do. it's no different really from the standard version, apart from a nice cover. And this has all my uh, monster goodness in it, where I, well, not the monsters, but this is where I have the rooms, where if I get to a certain room in one of the dungeons I'm creating, I'll roll on the table in here and come up with a random cave or a room. So that's one thing I've been doing. And then also using the monster alphabet too is another Goodman Games book and it's not it's system independent so it's not tied to a specific um, you know it's not D&D or, or it's not focused on Dungeon Crawl Classics um, so things like stats and ideas in there aren't a particular system but it gives you so much sort of flavor for the monsters that you can reference and build by you know cobbling together different bodies and features and abilities you know everything from blood to various other strange lore about them you can roll up in this book so that's been helpful 
And then just recently I also got the Cthulhu alphabet. So again, that's full of lots of ideas, even though it's kind of Cthulhu horror, there's plenty of fantasy things in there. I haven't been using that one as much, but uh, it's useful. And then uh, since I'm here, I have to show off this, which is the uh, my latest purchase. Now, normally I support my local good um, gaming store, but uh, even though I've... Uh, typically asked in the past if they would stock Goodman games. I'm in a kind of small regional area in the south of London in the UK and not many people know about anything beyond the you know the usual Dungeons and Dragons so I went to Amazon sadly for this but it was a very good price and this is their um, one of their special edition covers that has that sort of Egyptian feel and since I was writing this adventure with a sort of semi-Egyptian temple feel to the central Oblex dungeon I was kind of inspired by the fact that I spotted this and I'd always wanted one of these um, so it's basically the standard Dungeon Crawl Classics rules with all the usual goodness in there, but I've been working off the uh, softback and always wanted a hardback, so you know, I managed to get it. So I, here's my old softback, which I'd labelled up with some sections where I was using it again for um, different uh, monsters and things, because they've got some good references to standard men and poisons and other things in there that I was using as well as part of this uh, process. So I'm really hoping that my sound's working. So I'm going to do like a sound check um, because I normally get to about this point and I'm really nervous that the sound's not working. So just having a look. Yes, sound's working. Excellent. So now I'll actually talk about what I'm going to do today. So uh, this is now the shout out stage. So I'm going to talk about um, on the Raspberry Pi, if I bring that back up on the desktop here. You can see, obviously, I'm using the Google uh, Maps, and in the Oblex, which is that central ancient temple that's been left behind in this region in the ravine, I'll get down to the Oblex. There you go. I've got 23 pages so far um, done of the dungeon, um, and there's the barrow. And this is where I mention and shout out again. This tool that I use for doing this isn't this isn't hand drawn by me. Although the map at the top of the uh, adventure there, the uh, a whole region was hand drawn. This I use this tool set called One Page Dungeon, and it's called Water Waterboo, W A T A B O U, at itch.io. And if you go to Waterboo's channel on itch.io because it's itch.io just out of interest for anybody it's like a um it's like a creative indie creators uh website so you can jump on there and look at everything from you know 8-bit pixel games that people have regenerated to uh dungeon stuff uh, including this dungeon maker and Waterboo is just one of these multiple creators on there and he's been inspired by the Dyson style of uh, mapping to physically generate them on here. So it's it's not sort of grabbing a pre-generated one. It's actually on the fly generating the entire dungeon. You just hit enter and bang, you've got a dungeon. You can save it out as a ping. So there's one option on there, export to ping, and that saves it down locally. And that's what I do on here. I save it out locally and I then just drop the image into the Google Doc to reference. Now, there's a couple of interesting things that happen on there for gaming in that, first of all, there's these uh, indexes that randomly appear on there. And you can sort of decide to use those if you like. Just grabbing a drink. So you don't need to necessarily print those and save those out as well. You can turn off those index items and build your own ideas. But I tend to leave them on just for the fact it gives me something else random that I may use and to use as like a springboard off that to uh, reference something. So as you can see on room number two, it says it's got a massive almond-bound gate with a keyhole to the west. Um, number three, it says a broken sarcophagus containing a silver key. So when I've built this out, I kind of vaguely reference those items. And it said here, a fresco on the wall drives a, a person mad when we looked at it. So actually, I didn't detail that out yet, but there is a, um, a stone sort of men here type stone standing stone thing in here with some details on it. Now, one problem I had with these, as you can see, I've got the entranceway here, which goes into room seven, you say to yourself, why does the entranceway have room seven on there? And the reason for that is because this tool set, the Waterboo one page dungeon, which I just mentioned here, um, 
it doesn't give you all the numbers. So uh, basically, you'll get something like four or five of the dozen or so, or, or usually typically about 80%, 70 or 80% of the rooms have a number on them. And then you look at it and you think, well, actually, I kind of want to detail these numbers as you sort of crawl through here. So you have to edit them in a, a software editor to add numbers in. And of course, all I did was leave number one there, uh, which is what it was placed on when it auto-generated this for me. And then I've got, okay, I'll drop a seven on there, I'll drop a six in there and, and number as I go through. And that's how it's worked. But it's a bit old, it's typically totally random because then I've written down here, I've got my read aloud block, which I've written in the last few weeks on these sessions. I've said area seven entrance hall to this barrow mound. And I've said there's a cairn of skulls, a pied heart pelt high in this initial chamber with racks of bones behind. And I won't have to say, uh, I don't like that, I've said initial, I'm going to delete that off. So cairn of skulls, a pelt high in this chamber and racks of bones, um, let's just say stacked. Stacked behind. Um, tattered bones are laid across, tattered banners are laid across the bones with the symbol of the Rocksmith family, because this is the Rocksmith's family's um, tomb. And then I've said the main pile of skulls is in the east of the entrance hall and obscures the wall. To the northwest is a pool of water where the ground has collapsed over the ages and beyond it and slightly submerged is a stone door. To the west is a large stone door with a simple rusting iron ring for a handle. The pool of water is still and covered in a dozen or so plate sized dark grey lily pads. And then I've, I've said that that's a monster which I've made up called the Spikes Lily. Um, so if we just have a look down here, yeah, li Lilac Spike Lily. And that's the thing, if you get stuck in that water, it will attack you. And I've, this is my stat block, which I use again um, on the um, on this creation process, because as I go through and I found in the last few weeks, I just need something nice and clear when I'm going to be dropping some statistics in. So what am I going to do today? Because I've just given you the intro again, and you may have watched this before and don't want me rambling through, but hopefully it's always useful to get an overview of where I am. Um, so I've detailed out basically this barrow, which would be the first sort of dungeon if we're going like a point crawl type thing from one place to another. This is the first dungeon they encounter when they get a hook from being in the village. And in the classic, um, the sort of style of dungeon crawl classics is, you know, just get straight in there. So there'll be an encounter that the players are straight in instantly in the village, which is to do with a burial funeral going on. Um, I was going to I was going to write that up so that something awakens from the funeral and there's a, there's, a, there's an issue happening there straight away that gets an interest for the players to investigate the barrow. Why are some of the dead sort of popping back out of their graves? And that's because this Idenia goddess is slowly dying and uh, things are happening with the undead in the region. So then they do the barrow, then eventually they'll move on to do the actual central oblix itself. So I've done all the rooms for that. And so I think I've pretty much filled out most of the dungeons. It's the it's a couple only a couple of things left over. So let's uh, let's just bounce down a little bit further. So we have the first layer here of the oblix level one of the oblix as well. And again, you'll probably notice if I just sort of show you. Luckily, the level one from the top of that oblix, so if I show you the Scarpsy overlay here, so the oblix right in the middle of that map, if you look there, and the entranceway is a weird stone platform on the top. So once they've gone down into this there, it did detail nicely on this randomly generated dungeon. It stuck a one in there. And just to keep things, again, just to inform you about that one page dungeon and how it works, when you generate these dungeons like these and you just hit enter and it keeps re regenerating randomly, what I tend to do is just do a few until something looks about the right shape. And this looked good because it had that square feel, plus also the entrance was in the center. So that just felt just right for my obliques. So there was no plan. I didn't say to myself, I want four rooms or five rooms. I just randomly hit that button until something looked squarish um, and then I was able to dump it straight in here as well. So um, as I was saying the numbers don't always work out right but this one they weren't too bad so I had to add on like corridor one there, corridor two, corridor three with this C on there just to highlight that they had their own location details. Right now I'm going to go through exactly what I shall do in this session and it's a complete experiment so basically in the last week, I've got myself one of these um, 
well, two things have happened in the last two weeks. I've got a job again, so I've had like two and a half months out of work, so things have been a bit desperate. Um, well, not desperate, but just difficult in terms of uh, no income coming in. <laughs> and uh, yeah, But at the same time, now I've got myself a good job again. I, I did manage actually to get two or three days' work through the lockdown because I have some connections. I work in travel companies, and I had a few connections that were able to give me one or two days' work. Um, on a contract but that wasn't it wasn't a fantastic way of living for a while but um, I've now got myself a full-time job and uh, off the back of that I got a, um, a tablet to help with this uh, process and some of the work I do as well involves designing uh, architecture diagrams for computing systems and networks and things so I'm going to make use of this for that so I'll show you what I mean by that um, in terms of the desktop so here's my hand. So rather than the screen here, I've got a, a video pointing down a camera. And this is a new piece of kit I've got. It's called an XP Pen. I think it's 22 inch tablet. And uh, basically it works off these pen things that you can draw on. And I thought it would be ideal sort of situation. Also put the strange glove that comes with it. So this is interesting. It's a glove that only goes over like two fingers. Um, so there we have it. I mean, you'll see lots of these um, drawing people if you see their channels. So the glove allows you to sort of rub your hand over there um, without smearing like oils and things slowly over the uh, screen. So basically you pick up your pen and you can draw on there like that. And so I want to try and give these maps a little bit more of the Goodman Games flavour because at the moment these maps being like a standard uh, generated map from a computer generation, I've not really been able to give them much more flavor than just dump them in there and then detail out what the rooms are. So this is the second layer in the Oblix, um, but there's also uh, a level one I've got on here as well for the Oblix, which I was just showing you on there. There's the entrance hall. This room has the crab encounter. If you've been watching the videos, you've seen that. This one's like a f uh, got a grilled flame floor on it with an unhatched, uh, an unborn egg of a dragon sitting in like a metal nest on top of it. Um, and this is where Idenair, the goddess, is um, first encountered by the players if they go into this room. And then eventually this, this layer here lets you down. This is actually going to be a spiral staircase, but it doesn't really show it very well like that too. So things like that, I thought, oh, I'll try and edit it up and give it a little bit more, you know, flavour. You know, the Goodman Games maps are you know, way beyond my skill in terms of drawing because they have really great art where they integrate pictures of the monsters along with like a, a kind of, they warp the scale. So you might see a tower on one side and then another room. Uh, I haven't got any to hand to show you, but there's certainly much more interesting than this kind of flat uh, square layout. But mind you, this has its place too. And because this generator that I've used has been able to let me do it, um, I've been getting on with it. And then additionally, I've got my Scarpsy um, full map there as well, which is the one with the layout. This was all hand drawn, which I did live as well in front of me. Um, but I'd like to um, detail it up a bit more um, in terms of being able to just show a little bit more flavor and design to it. So uh, if I zoom in there, you can see my hand drawnness of it. If you look around areas like this, you can see I use like a gray pen to add on some shading around the barrows there. Um, if I move it over as well, you can see the rest of the, the town here. So there's Cliff's End here. And again, you can see how sketchy I was with my, my pen there. Because um, I just tend to go for it. I'm not like the best drawer. But so what I can do now and what I'd like to do is literally go through these layers. So starting with the barrow here, uh, as I mentioned, if we flip back briefly again to the uh, raspberry and then have a look at the barrow section and just scroll up a bit here have a look at the rocksmith barrow above keep going keep going what i can do is reference the room here i'm going to change the names on the labels on the rooms because i want the entrance way to be room one and then update my document accordingly so that instead of coming into a room seven uh, they come into room one and it just sort of flows a bit better. So look, there's the entrance hall, room seven. I want that to say room one. 
I've also detailed there's a pile of skulls in this corner and loads of lily pads on the water feature in the corner there, which is like a, a danger because of the creature underneath it. So that's what I'm going to do. Switch between this and the desktop. And now I can actually go to this screen. And this, rather than my top-down view of my desk, which was this view, so you can see my hand moving everything, uh, instead, this is basically my screen of the tablet. So everything you see me do on here is basically, there's my little paint bucket there. You can see as I click the different tools, you'll be able to see me sort of working and desperately trying to do something creative on here. <laughs> so actually talking about mapping, because people can do these. Um, this is quite an expensive um, XP Pen 22 um, is the model for reference of the, uh, and it's not sponsored in any way as well. So by the way, no one's given me this, I've had to pay for it. Um, but it's the XP Pen 22, which I'm using on my Mac. And you don't need this level of kit. If you have an iPad or an, even an Android um, tablet or something, they all have art packages on now, which you can probably do just as good as this. I got this one because as I say, I use it for my work as well. Uh, for doing network diagrams and bits and pieces on. And also I'm trying to train myself to do art. So, um, and as I said, I want to give this a Goodman Games Dungeon Crawl Classics feel. I want to like ramp this up a little bit by doing some drawing on here. Uh, but I'll just to show you what I've done so far. And also like massive warning now, basically. Because... Um, I've not done this technically before. I'm literally streaming. And while I stream, I'm going to be trying to do this drawing. And also, I'm like a primitive drawer. <laughs> so I have to use references while I'm doing it. So the only drawing I've done on this tablet to date, because I've only had this the last week, is what you see right here. So I'm going to springboard, obviously, off the back of trying to draw onto these maps with just some small details. Um, but ultimately, I want to redo the scarp scene map completely by doing like a overlays on there and doing more detail around these standing stones to make it look a little bit more professional. Although nothing wrong with what I've done already. I just want to experience drawing some of the map elements on here. So going back to this, um, what I've done on these and just to talk through this, um, I've got like a... Um, a size here which is like 4,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels so that's quite a massive file I mean that would save out as probably like 15 megabytes or 20 megabyte file in that order um, but then and this is the, like, the crucial thing as I zoom in here you can see basically the pen sizes that I'm using I started out I drew this layered version here and if I drag up my pen size you can see the kind of thickness I've got on my pen as I draw it on there and that's sort of in between this fatter one here and this one but I wasn't happy with this because if you have a look at some of the details they're quite fine and as you zoom out because if you want this as a map element you're not going to be able to see it close up as you zoom out it starts to lose a bit of it some of its qualities it still looks nice it's kind of fine but what I did is I copy and pasted it over here and then I just fattened up all the lines so that it would look better from a zoomed out position. And that's really where I am when I'm now looking at this barrow here, even though I'm not doing map elements on the barrow, I'm just gonna draw in um, bits and pieces here to potentially improve the art on here rather than just being a plain room. But as you can see, I'll need a certain thickness to that as I build up a layer. So what I'll do is I'll, first of all, is I'll create a new layer. And basically I'm using Pixelmator Pro. I mean, you can see that right up in the top of the screen there, wiggle the mouse around there. It's Pixelmator Pro, uh, basically because the Adobe Suite now is a fortune uh, and you have to pay a monthly subscription on, on the Adobe Suite. I think it's like $25 a month or something just for Adobe Photoshop if you wanted to use that. And because uh, I use Adobe InDesign, which I've used to do uh, creation of books. And the actual um, adventure here that's beneath the Valley of the Ultranoles, 
I will transfer that in a stage and I'm hopefully show that as well because I'll be transferring that into InDesign at one point when I've updated all the graphics and got some art and things in there as well. I'll move it to a two column format, the classic adventure style book, two column format and I'll stick it in InDesign. And um, and I do, I pay on and off for InDesign because I've produced, I've published two books in the past. Um, I use it to do all the layout in InDesign and then I kind of cancel the subscription for a bit because it's so expensive to keep hold of uh, InDesign because their apps on Adobe are expensive. But InDesign's more desktop publishing. Photoshop is obviously uh, artwork and most of the sort of pro drawers would use something, something like Photoshop on a desktop like this. Of course, I'm just using Pixelmator Pro, which is a, a cheap-ish, you know, $30 sort of level price of an application on my Mac. But there's others similar to that on PC as well, which you can use. So hopefully that's like enough of an overview. And because I'm right in the middle of it here, I'm literally going to be jumping around looking at references because one of the things I need to do, I don't, I don't directly copy people's work, um, but what, as with all educational processes, you want to look at what someone else has done and then reuse it rather than necessarily diving straight in um, and trying to come up with something from scratch. You know, a reference is always really, really handy to have. So I know for a start on the right hand side here, I've got um, uh, some uh, skulls and then I've got the lily pads that are on this section over here. So if I just dive in there and I think, okay, I'm gonna try and make a pile of bones and skulls and things. You know, how might I do that? And this is where it gets kind of like scary because I'm going to sort of dive in and try and actually draw live, which is going to be potentially bad because <laughs> I'm not a great drawer. But, you know, what's the, you know, why not experiment? Because I'm trying to make up, up the game on here. Oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to warm myself up first because um, I want to try and take out the um, numbering on here because I want this to be number one. And so I'm just going with an eraser. Feel like a surgeon or something. Um, actually, that's interesting. My that's something I may have to fix later on. But it looks like the the image has, as you can see, it's like a faintly not white colour, um, which is not ideal because um, I'd have to pick that colour for my background all the way through. So I'm going to make these white. That's the other thing I'm going to do. Uh, so there you go. It's kind of filled out a white image in there instead. Although that. That bothered me because it smoothed the edges, so I'm going to just undo that. Turn off this smooth edges thing and then go again. There you go, so that's not wiped out. But now I've got a white thing in there and obviously you can see where I had that seven. Um, it's also gone a bit funny. This is one of the interesting things about all these sort of modern tools like this now is they help you so much, like it didn't want to overwrite some of my um, neat work in the corner there but at the same time um, I'm now left with a very faint outline of a seven in the middle there which I didn't want. So now I could actually draw on number one on here and that's one of the things I was going to think of doing is possibly drawing the numbers to give it a little bit more of a, um, a natural feel and of course again I'm absolutely awful at doing this but why not uh, try so if I try and get myself an actually coloured pen over here just try and draw the number one on there in some sort of sensible way so that it just looks like um, potentially a little bit more rough and ready in terms of hand-drawn ability. So there we go, sort of getting my eye in there <laughs> by drawing a number one. Excellent work, Robin. Um, as he praises myself and then realise that maybe I've gone a bit fat on the bottom. Now one thing you can do with these tablets is that you, you sort of press one button and then you get like an eraser instead so you can sort of trim off things if you don't feel like they're perfectly right. So then that brings me to the actual number one which is over here and I shall just scrub that off while I'm at it and again I need to fill that room with the uh, white because um, Silver, that's not what I want. Snow. Because when I scrub that out, I don't want that unusual pale background colour in there. Now, of course, the other thing, I'm using quite a fine eraser tip on that, but I don't mind. It just takes a little bit longer to clear it off. So what I'm going to do now is just because while I've got that in mind, I'm going to 
drop this white in all of the different areas to um, literally pre-prepare myself so I'm not going to have to go in and then uh, worry about the fact that there's a faint colour to the uh, dungeon room background. So straight away that's given it a little bit of more of a natural feel hasn't it? That's a one and then I'm going to try type a two in this room as well because that's what I'm going to do um, room progression wise. So get the black back and again I'll probably just do it's interesting because on the generator it puts them over the grid um, so maybe I'll, I'll do that as well I'll just sort of do the two in the same sort of fashion straight through there so then you've got the challenge that have you done it too big I don't care at this stage <laughs> I'm just putting it in So that is too big, um, but fortunately I have undo buttons right before me here. Look at the magic of that. So that is too big, but also I've just recognized I'm doing these on the background layer. So I'm going to go back up here. If you look in the top left hand corner, I'm going to go to the top layer because I don't want to draw these over the masked image I've got here. Basically, I want to do everything I draw as a new layer. And of course, I'm happy that I filled in the white um, by using that bucket fill. Um, but all these extra layers, like this this one, really should be another layer. I'm going to leave that one there because I'm not going to mess about. But um, I, I do want to make sure that I'm not basically going into the raw image. So if I then got rid of that layer, you'd see that that two would kind of disappear from there and then reappear again because basically... Um, it's a layer on top that I can deal with rather than it actually corrupting my master image. So it's just a, a good tip if you're using a tool like this one or a Photoshop is to, to mess around with the layers like that. And also I can press this lock and that means that my background layer, which is the, the map itself here, then I can't edit or change it. It just means that I'm working completely on the layer above that as I, as I work through. So, um, so now I've just messed around and done a bit of drawing there to try and get myself warmed up a tiny bit. I'm now going to actually try and attempt to draw skulls. So I'm going to use a, um, a, a smaller, narrower brush size. And just one thing I can do is I can change that with this uh, button on the little thing. So I'm probably going to go for like roots. Oops, that's too far. Maybe like a size four will do actually to try and draw skulls. Now again, I could do these skulls somewhere else. I don't need to draw it on here. Um, it just so happens that it's just convenient to, to draw it on the same place and then try and get a feel for how sort of cartoony I want those to look too. So um, essentially, obviously I can just sort of, I'm just thinking that what size do I want? I basically want um, classic sort of blacked out eyes and um, lower jaw, sort of narrow lower, jaw coming in and then up and around the eyes it's already looking a little bit cartoonish i'm going to zoom in there as well just because i think i could work better if i'm actually up close and personal with it and uh, then i'm going to undo that because i'm not completely happy with it but uh, start again i'll get there eventually i'm going to draw it straight on rather than trying to get an angle in there So I might make my uh, my tip even smaller, just because it's just feeling a little bit too big at, th at four pixels. That's coming in probably too sharp, isn't it? The other side was better, but you can just sort of scrub that off. That's the benefits of being able to use the um, the eraser that's sort of stuck on here. So my only question is, do I do, you know, I do the teeth in here like that, just with some small markings. I don't know what I was doing on the bottom. Okay. 
and then I might just put like a hairline, oh that's black, I need a little hairline crack type thing along the top here. Let's say I'm just trying to make it look like it's um, sort of rough and ready really, rather than it being a completely fine looking thing. So there it is. Um, so I can probably pick up the selection tool here and then have a think about what I want to do. So potentially twist it around a, a wee bit there. Oops. I need to reselect it. Oh, didn't get the full selection. There you go. Uh, I'm learning, I'm learning, but I'm trying to twist it round with the right button. There we go. That hasn't picked it up. There you go, education number one. I'm on the right layer, but it hasn't picked up. Oh, it has picked up my skull. I so wonder why it didn't twist it round. That's better. So I can twist it round. I can also then shrink it down a bit. Um, maybe if I press the shift key then it locks the aspect ratio as well so if this is where the pile of bones is I can start to sort of stack them up here in various different shapes and forms so that one first skull bit of an effort but at least it's done so um, you know I'm trying here <laughs> uh, and then I now start to draw another one so if I what's unselect all I think it's deselect is D. So just so that I'm not selected that anymore, I'll try and draw some other bone related debris. So I might just draw a uh, your classic sort of human bone thing. That isn't working very well for me. And again, and this is coming in rather big, but um, I'll shrink it down when it uh, when it goes through. Um, yeah, you know, what I'm noticing here, and it might be something I need to fix for a future point, is that. Um, my resolution's not too high on this map, so basically, even though I'm coming in nice and close, it's still sort of looking a little bit blocky. But that, you know, it's not the end of the world. I, if you zoom out um, to something like the scale, it would be. You can already see that that bone is now looking much more uh, sensible, and so is the skull. Although the skull could probably be more defined in many ways, actually. But we'll see. So let's have a look here what we can do next and just see about zooming back in here. Oh, pentablet quick. Oh, look, here we go. I did think I might have like an accidental issue here. So classic. No wonder the pentablet stopped working then. I was just about to zoom in and it, uh, eh, it's not a good sign, is it? Look. Let's get rid of Pixelmator and just see if uh, if I can reload it without a full crash again. Tech support alive while I'm streaming. Quit Pixelmator Pro. Find it. Reload it. sunshine appearing behind me. So there's the barrow that I was working on. Yeah, pen tablet's gone altogether, I think. I may have to abort the drawing and go back to doing some more dungeon actual prep on the uh, layouts. 
because I think this tablet is going to just crash again. It's got a permanent issue. We may be in luck. We may be in luck. I don't think we are in luck. Oh no, it's up, it's up. It is up. It hasn't crashed again. It's... It's working on the correct monitor. We're about to zoom in. Let's see if it works again. No, 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 we're... Uh, completely in a strange world of failing tablets. So maybe I should have tried this a bit further last night before I got stuck in here. Um, one more effort, one more try and then I'm going to go abort and do some actual dungeon writing rather than dungeon drawing. It's got the right monitor. But those two crashes have wasted it. So there you go, that's a good, uh, this is probably like the best review if you'll get of an X Pen running on a Mac, as in, <laughs> after about half an hour, it just decided, right, the software is not gonna play, play ball anymore. But uh, given how I'm persevering, persevering strongly here, I'm going to try one more button click. No, there you go. It is broke. So let's go back to doing some actual draw, um, actual dungeon prep because that's not going to do me any good at all. Right. So apologies for the technical issues. I'll have that resolved when I do another tablet view. But at the moment, that's messed up badly. So goodbye, tablet. Hello. Beneath the Valley of the Ultranols, and I shall just work my way through the rest of the adventure because that'll be a little bit easier to, to do rather than fussing with this screen given it's just crashed on me. Right, so there's a couple of things I just need to do to tidy up. You know what I didn't try? I didn't try turning it off and on again. Let's give it one more go. I'm going to try and turn this on and off again just because I just realised, aha, a turn on and off may also be a solution. So one last attempt. It's come back up, fire up the pen tablet software. It's crashed. No, that's it, it's going off, goodbye. Right, so. I'm just covering it up and then getting my keyboard out. So and I'm going to brighten up things here a bit as well because um, things are a bit dark where I'm trying to uh, get myself organized. And I've got my correct mouse for the Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Niles. Okay, so, well, that was interesting. We nearly... Um, we nearly got some drawing done on the map, but uh, as I say, it was the first time I used it last night, and it looks like I've got a driver problem with the app there, so I'm going to have to see why that is uh, crashing out and uh, come back to that in the future. So what I did last time was I started to use these stat blocks and tidied them up, and I know that by going into the... Um, let's just pick that up and copy that. By going in further to the obliques in the center of the map, we will see that there are a couple of more blocks like that, which I need to finish. So keep going, keep going back to the obliques. So this is the start of the obliques on the top. Oh, that's a, an error. Those are the gold bats. So these are the gold bats on the top of the obliques when you fly down um, or if you land down in some way onto the top. Let's have a look here. So bring up scarfs up see. So there's that top of that oblix in the center there, and that's where the gold bats are. And then if we scroll down, we can see level one. And then we can start to see through the different areas which I've done right down to level two coming up. And I think what I need to do is there's a couple of extra stat blocks to tidy up as we work down. So these were the jade bones, which were skeletons which had um, small fire 
uh, beetles in their chest which could spit fire at the same time. So we had beetle fire, they could do an attack at plus one for 1d6. There's only four skeletons in there, but they're quite dangerous when it comes to the fact that they are spitting fire out of their chest as well as um, clawing at the players. If I can find the bit that gets down to the next level. And then there's Idenae, the goddess, um, who's significantly more powerful. And I have some details there before we get down to Oblix level two. So let's start tidying this up a bit because I know I didn't do the sort of read aloud block. So I shall start with the read aloud. specifically because I have been trying to sort of follow the standard format, which is you put the read aloud section in italics when you're writing an adventure, just because that's the bit that's easy for a games master re to reference. Um, so I can just call this as well, room seven, I'll just call it lower, uh, lower entrance hall, lobby I'll call it. Um, I'm going to call it, because it's the temple down here as well, I'm going to call it Temple temple Entrance Lobby. Um, I'll tell you what sound feels better, Anti-Chamber, doesn't it? Just feels a little bit more antique than Lobby. Lobby sounds like somewhere you're in a hotel with a, with a bellboy pushing trolley around, which is it's not very modern. I mean, too modern. So this is a small room with an iron... Statue of a monarch, mountain warrior bearing it. So, so I'm just say after descending the stairs, um, a small room. So you enter. A small room, and but then I'm going to say dominated by by an iron statue of a mountain warrior bearing a spear. The figure looks like a northern pla plainsman and is and is very and is so sculpted in fine detail. Um, so then I'm going to say, as a, just a note below, local players, uh, local characters may recognise this guard. That's not been seen for hundreds of years, for, for centuries. They've only seen in tapestries. Yeah, I just say locals may recognise the plainsman garb as a type of style of fashion that's not been seen for centuries, and they've only seen in tapestries or. Just only seen in tapestry is fine. Um, players may appear here for my news page. And then on to this one. From, and I'm going to say this room, enter. There's a descend to this room from Idenae's bedchamber above 
and I'm going to reference the room number. You know, one thing I was thinking of doing is actually uh, labeling all of the sort of rooms clearly, which I was obviously doing with that art package, which just failed on me miserably, but also putting a little cutout on each page so you could see potentially the room that you're in, so and where it and, and the entrance ways and ways out, so like a mini a mini map, uh, so that you don't have to keep paging back, because that's what I'm going to have to do now, obviously. Um, is to keep paging backwards and forwards. If I go back up, and just remind myself of the room number, so I have to go all the way back to the map of the floor above. And there it is, room four. So that's the spiral staircase, which I would have drawn on there if I wasn't failed so miserably by the uh, application on the XP Pro pen application. Coming down, coming down again. I've gone too far. I've gone way too far. Here it is. Room four. So yes, place this into this room for my a bedchamber room four. Then I'm just going to move this thing here as well, just down, just because it's this is more like the first piece of text that the um, the judge will want to read out. And then there you go. So then I'll say this room was once a grand entrance hall to this floor, uh, to this floor of the temple. It has various drapes and painted wood panels. The only other obvious section depicting I won't say depicting the only other obvious exit is a door in the north which is made of the same rusting iron metal as the statue and there's a series of ugly spikes on it with um, with the remains <laughs> with the remains of um previous visitor hooked over the I know resting resting over the the doors shot metal hooks I'll call them now okay the door is, uh, so the door has a personality, uh, the door is intelligent, just a sort of, and was the, and is the spirit of, it was stuck up for his old priest, the temple of the temple called Ijax, and since his death he has been bound to the door to first check for the rites of passage for visitors. Um, Ijax is waiting for the inscription for room 2A on the first floor. So basically on the um, first floor there was a room with an inscription at the base of a statue that could be learned phonetically. If they actually have learned that and reuse it here, it allows them ease of access through here. Um, the door is intelligent and there's the spirit of a stuck up and privileged old priest. Da, da, da. So they have to read it aloud to the door to allow them through. If angered by the visitors, Ijax will shout command at the rusting iron statue in the room, causing it to animate an attack. If one of the characters speaks the phonetically memorized phrase in the base of the silver statue in the poor room, Ijax will allow the group through and the statue will calmly return. So what I haven't done here is I haven't done the statue. So given that I've got um, a little bit of time left, I'm going to, on the stream today, I'm going to detail out this iron statue. Basically, I, I, put, I put it in there as uh, information, but I haven't done the stats for it. So I'm going to do that. 
So to get that, I'm going to have to just pop up a few pages again and find a stat block. There's one of the uh, jade bones. Copy paste. Here's the level two. So basically for that room one, I'm going to drop this, the stat block in. And as I mentioned before, I use these stat blocks, which is a table in Google Docs, because it's easy for me to see, but the, realistically, probably when I publish this, I'll, I'll use the traditional stat blocks that you see in the, in the Goodman Games books, just to, to match their style, really. And um, uh, I think someone asked me last week if I'm going to publish this, but I will do as a as a kind of a cheap PDF kind of thing when I when I've got it together, um, but maybe I'll keep my stat blocks like that since I, it's a kind of an, an independent publication anyway. Um, I may wish to keep it looking a little bit more interesting in terms of ease of access to these. I also was thinking in terms of game design. I was thinking that maybe I could because um, it'll be a PDF. What I could do with like a back page or two is I could put all the monster stats in blocks like that. Um, so they could be printed and cut out if someone wanted to do that. If you're around a table and you wanted to um, have something nice and easy to reference, you know, printing them out as a little card pack that you can then use as a deck would, could be easier than uh, having to reference the book. Anyway, so I'm going to call this one a mounted, mounted, um, call it a mounted horseman. stretch that over just annoyingly a tiny bit and I'll just call it maybe an, an iron golem or something like that as a kind of a class so of course it's not going to have claws and it's not going to have beetle fire and everything else will be different here so this is where I now need to work out what I'm going to use from the Goodman Games um, book as a basis for the stats when I create this mounted iron uh, warrior um, so I'll grab the the main book because it's a bit lighter than using my um, big hardback version. I've got my paperback and let's dive into there and have a look. What I might also need to do is just sort out the focus on it a little bit too. That's a bit easier to read. That's focused. Done. Landed right on the spell page there. So in the back here we have variety of monsters so you can see servitor servitor might work um devilish creations of chaos laws oh no servitors never found alone but always in small groups okay so not a servitor i thought that might be some kind of like robotic kind of monster thing but it's not i'm just browsing through here to find something that would look relevant for a kind of unmounted iron golem um you know an owlbear has the sort of strength maybe that i'm looking for and so would maybe an ogre um but let's see if they do have like golems or anything in here. But, so living statue, there we go. Um, I'll move that over so we can just sort of take a quick look at what uh, the stats look like. So it's got an amazing initiative because of course it's got the um, surprise because it's just been sat there as a statue then leaps alive. Um, plus three melee, one D8. It says armor plus 14 if it's crystal. Iron is 18. Um, and then the hit dice goes up as well and then the movement so I'd give it slightly more movement because it's, it's, it's mounted one action die so I'm going to give mine two action die as well I think I'm going to give it a hoof attack uh, like a raise up and kick the players either front or rear with its hooves and then the guy on the top will have um, some kind of weapon but it, I think it's not going to I'm not going to need to represent the weapon because basically I'm going to say that when it does an attack, it gets the plus three melee and does one d8 with some whatever sword or spear. Spear, probably, because that would allow him to reach down more readily from the top of the um, the mounted horse. So that's what we're going for, living statue. So I'm going to flip back and I'm going to start to detail that out. There was something else down here. Let's read uh, read what it does. So it says it's programmed, simple instrument completely motionless and causes surprise so basically if it did leap alive but you know every savvy player is going to know that potentially the statue will leap alive the only attempt is the simple robots and can obey um, only the most basic instructions 
that's it. I mean, it's really nice, simple. That was a nice and quick one to find. So I'm going to go back to the um, Raspberry Pi and I'm going to start putting these details in. So basically, it's got to be neutral, hasn't it? Even though I didn't read that yet. But yes, it's a neutral because it's just a, a beast. Uh, so I'll put neutral N in there. And of course, because it was the iron version of a uh, living statue. Yeah, I wonder if they've got golems as well, actually, just to out of interest. I'm going to go to G and have a look. The goblins, no golems. So basically, this is the equivalent of a of a sort of a golem. Um, but of course, the iron version has 18 armor class to go in there. And the iron version also has 4d8 hit dice. So it's quite a, quite a beast. I'm going to have to work out what that is randomly. Or use the... Uh, there's a website that I go to and I can't remember what it's called, but it basically allows you to work out what the uh, what 48, what an average of 48 would be. Um, then we now know that it's got two, it's going to have two action dice because it's got the horse and the spear. So I shall just detail those out here as well. So before I forget, so spear and then below there, I'm going to call, I'm just going to call it hoof kick. I will say, I will say horse kick. So we've basically then going to give the, the spear is going to be a 1d8. But I'm going to, I'm going to bump it down. I'm going to say from his spear, he's going to do 1d6. Um, but the horse kick is going to be, um, yeah, or shall I make them both 1d8? It's one creature, so it's going to be outnumbered typically. So basically make every hit powerful, 1d8, and then the horse kick can be 1d8 as well. No, it could be 1d6. It's going to be 1d6, that's fine. But it's plus three melee, which I'll take from the book, and I'll say the same for the horse kick. So it's got two um, Goodman games, uh, basically, uh, if you know the rules or not, anyway. Uh, action die are basically your d20s and allow you to do uh, more than one action. So if you're a fighter and you get to a certain level, you get two attacks, you actually end up with one d20 and then maybe another dice of another size uh, for your second action. And basically when you're building, look at that, I've got house, horse. Uh, when you are uh, using... Uh, monsters and creating monsters some of them can have like 60 20 which is basically just saying it's got six attacks and uh, then if I get to the fortitude I bet that's quite high plus four reflex of a living statue is well, minus two and will is minus two because they're pretty uh, basic We'll add minus two. So I was going to get rid of that. So let's just range or something. Move, I was going to put a 40 because while it's mounted, it's, it can really charge. And we've got hit dice correct, AC. Initiative is very high because when, it, when it's still, it gets that surprise. So plus six on surprise. So I'll just write down here, SP for special. Uh, the iron, iron mounted warrior has a 50% charge to surprise players. when it leaps, when it jumps from statue to live form. I mean, otherwise they're not intelligent. Da, da, da. And they get a free attack. A free attack from held spear and horse 
kick on this. Now I'm going to say it gets one. Now that is fair, isn't it? On the first round, it doesn't come out and do a boot and kick. It gets a single free attack. And I'll just say that's fair enough. A single free attack. Judge can then decide whether they want it to be the horse tap trampling out and trampling the players or um, or not. Um, I wonder if um, I, I'm going to give it another special because it's unique to this room. And just because if we think about it and talk about this room again, the door itself in this Temple Room 7, um, it's an intelligent door and the spirit of a stuck up uh, privileged old priest of the temple called Ijax. And since his death, he's been bound to the door to Da, 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 to uh, to check the rites of passage, so he's waiting for the inscription to be read aloud. Um, and one thing I'll say here as well, probably just to flesh that out, so he will engage the players. With a um, stiff... Stiff demand for. I don't want to say the password for the access phrase. <laughs> I'm basically basically I'm saying password, but I'm just going to say the access phrase. Um, and we'll uh, we'll get increasingly impatient. Dither. So then it says, if angered by the visitors, he will shout a command at the rusting iron mounted statue. So of course they can also parley with him. I mean, it doesn't mean, uh, I think this phrase is fine there. So if angered by the visitors, he will shout a command at the rusting iron, he will shout a command and so, and the rusting iron mounted statue in the room will animate and attack. If one of the players speaks the phonetic memorized, that's it. So basically, because there's the idea that there's spikes on this door as well, and I said that there was um, uh, someone had died on there, and since his death, he's been on the door, but go a bit further up. Since the north is made of the same rusting iron, and has a series of spikes on it, with the remains of a previous visitor resting over the door's sharp metal hooks. Uh, I'm going to say, and with patches of a chain shirt still in good shape. So that's given me the view that there's a little something that I can take off there and use if they want to change shirt. But um, I was thinking that the the attack of the horse kick was designed to try and push someone up against the door. So basically it will charge in. Um, so it will get a single free attack and attempt to charge a player in front of the door. And the door. Uh, if kicked by the horse player can be forced back five foot and uh, may resist this uh, by making a reflex save of um, DC Fourteen. <laughs> I have to change that, but I just thought fourteen will do. So basically, uh, I think that realistically, uh, to, uh, to avoid being pushed back. So basically, every time this thing kicks uh, with the horse, because it's got the two actions, it can kick someone back away from it, or um, be potentially kicking them in. Uh, forced back to da -da -da, kicking them into the door 
if the spiked door is directly via force back into it, they will suffer D3 damage from the spikes. And that's it. So I mean, that's that room done. And really, I've I've done now an hour and fifteen, and um, and must apologise for the fact I had technical issues, but I'll resolve that. And I think I said at the start that uh, something might go wrong, and it did. But I think I still gave some decent content there in terms of at least you were able to see me and my thoughts about how I was going to work those maps to give them more of a dungeon crawl classics feel by drawing art onto them. And I say, I only got this set up last night and I think I've got too many monitors um, because I've got a monitor here with the chat screen uh, beside me. I've got another monitor in front with the main uh, stream going on. And then I've got um, a secondary one on my left where I had some art references I was using to do the sketching, plus the, the screen itself, which I was doing the drawing on. I've probably just overloaded the system, but... Uh, I'll have to look at that and make sure that I can run this smoothly for a future session where I'm going to do the art as well. But I'm pleased I've got that iron golem. It's always handy. Uh, I always feel a slight achievement by finishing a room and polishing a room off a bit. I mean, it's still always going to be subject to future editing as I work through here. And also, I'll just make that bold for now. And, um, you know, as you do this, it's quite often, it's like an exercise really in coming up with a standardized format you know what gets made bold where do you put the name do you put a, a dash after it do you put anything uh, uh, include any extra uh, read aloud bits further down in a room's detail because maybe I should put a read aloud section when the thing uh, comes alive but probably not I could even do a read aloud section for what the uh, the dead spirit of the of the priest that's stuck and bound into this iron spiked door but um you know, kind of leave that up to the judge as well, isn't it? If they know there's an there's a priest in there that demands something, I don't need to write down the specifics of what they say. That should just be part of role playing. They they can keep that simple when you're doing this or complex as you like, can't you? You could be a judge that adds something really flowery and a booming voice comes out of the door demanding uh, the access phrase, or uh, they could just say the door asks you for an access phrase, and and it can be just as fun for a role playing game. You don't have to um, be making flowery, full-on um, vocalisation. I might say, the door demands an access phrase. So you can also, you know, <laughs> shout that bit out or just say that the door speaks, whatever you're going to do. So I'm driving off in a strange direction there with uh, a little bit about actual performance of a games master or a judge in... Uh, um, Inkerman Games. I'll tell you what I found recently just as an observation as I'm here and I'm chatting about that kind of thing. I um, started work back, which I mentioned at the start of this stream, but in the last week and a half I've got another job and I'm working you know, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5.30 kind of thing at home at this desk. And what I found is that I tend to, if I used to work in an office, even though I was home later so you didn't, you know, here I finish work at 5.30 and I can go and do whatever I like. I could start cooking food and all sorts of good stuff. But um, obviously I used to have a commute 40 minutes plus or so um, from when I was in an office. But there was something about that break which meant that when I came back I was kind of reset and I was sort of ready for, oh, I'm going to get hold of my games and do some painting of miniatures, do some streaming or whatever I'm going to do. Now I'm stuck here. Like I roll into the evening, and earlier in the week I did a, I was judging Starless Sky, the uh, um, the um, funnel game for Dungeon Crawl Classics, and I felt really tired. I'd run out of, <laughs> I'd been doing Zoom all day and you know chatting to colleagues and work and new ones, which was taking a lot of information in, and then in the evening I had three hours of this game. And I'd lost a bit of my spirit, I think. I was doing, I think I was doing well and I was taking it calmly and delivering it. But I got to some scenes later on where they were having a fight and I lost all my usual gumption had gone. I'm normally like, you know, explaining how the gore sprays off the top of the beast's head when you, you know, whack it with a mace or whatever. And I normally give them that extra bit of flavor in response to whatever a player is doing. Um, but I was just sort of going, yeah, you hit it, 1d6 damage blah 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 <laughs> which wasn't giving the game much energy was it um but you've got to you know have a bit of fun and get stuck in sometimes and and when you're tired after work all day that's not always possible 
So there it is, the iron golem, uh, uh, the, uh, well, living statue, golem, whatever you want to call it. I like living, I like the phrase living statue anyway. Um, it feels retro, doesn't it, rather than golem. And golems could be different, couldn't they? They only have in here living statues for crystal stone, iron, um, crystal stone and iron. But you could create anything you wanted, a clay version or whatever else, and then give them some other abilities. I was reading a book recently where they had a golem in there, that a stone one, and it had abilities to do things like bring up spikes of stone from the ground and things. So it's more of an elemental, but it was still kind of golemy or living statue kind of thing too. So that's one thing you can mix up. So actually, it reminds me actually. I wonder if they do have elemental in here just before I go. Um, oh yeah, they do have elemental. So they have air elemental um, and the extra planar creatures, elemental of air. Elemental of fire, water, and earth. So they were all in here, actually. Um, earth and with a solid, plodding masses of earth and stone. So, in fact, it, again, just with this spirit of Dungeon Crawl Classics, you could use anything. So I could have made the statue an earth statue or something, and made, said it was made of stone instead of an um, iron golem, it, or an iron living statue. I could have said it was an earth elemental and given it some other weird abilities. So look, it says it can dig through solid earth and stone at a rate of 30 foot, where their stony hide is difficult to penetrate. Yeah, they have armor class 20. Wow, that earth elemental is even more powerful than this mounted horseman, but I'm glad I've read that and spotted that they have elementals in the main book anyway, because I, I do like those in a game, and they will do that soon. So I'm going to sign off and just again apologise for some technical faults earlier on um, and um, wish you all a good week. I'll be back again next week and now I'm just trying to find the right mouse to turn off my stream. Um, but I can turn off the stream with the button, I've got all that sorted. So great, thanks for listening if you have. Uh, hopefully you got some decent information about the stuff I was doing with the drawing initially and the ideas I had. And then I've given you a little bit of an extra uh, room that I've done there with the Iron Golem and used that, uh, that flavour there from the book of using the stats from the book. But then I've gone, OK, situationally in that room, I want to be able to kick someone into the spikes on the door. So I gave the horse a kick and then gave it a special ability as well. And that's the sort of thing you can do with Dungeon Crawl Classics, sort of make up the rules as you, as you play. And that's the spirit of... Um, um, just you know, DCC all round really. You know, if you like the idea of something, build it in there. You're you're in charge of your own game, and if you're writing some background for something, you don't have to uh, uh, submit yourself to forensic views of why um, that spikes would be one d three, or why would a player get forced back into it or something. You know, just use the rules common sense wise. I made it. I made the character give an opportunity to do a reflex save against the pushback. If they fail. They could potentially get pushed into the uh, into the door or the spikes. Um, that's where it is. So hopefully that was of interest, and I'll stop the stream and see you next week. And I'll, next time I'll have my uh, technology working again, which I'll be tried and tested. Cheers.